Those of you that were at La Paloma last night probably saw a lot of this, so you have to bear with me. Uh, the, uh, what, what I wanted to do was to talk about Project Starshot and some other things that we are, that are associated with it, uh, and then kind of open up to discussions. So, uh, you know, without further ado, let me start, first of all, our sponsors. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the people on the left there are our board. Uh, you know, if you lived under a rock for the last 50 years, I'll tell you who they are. Uh, you know, Stephen Hawking, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and Yuri Milner. Uh, I, I think a lot of you got a chance to meet Yuri last night. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the true visionary, and uh, you know, anybody that listened to him talk knows that you know, he is a damn good physicist. So, uh, pretty cool. And then on the uh, on the right there. Uh, uh, are the, you know, sort of four key principles here that, uh, and I think everybody's here today. Uh, you know, Avi Loeb, Chairman Advisory Committee. Uh, Mae Jemison is, uh, is uh, with the 100-year starship, is working closely with us. Uh, Phil Lubin is the, sort of the, the, the laser guy, and we're going to have him do stuff. Where, is, is Phil here this morning? Yep. Uh, but uh, this was at the, uh, the, uh, uh, at the announcement, uh, uh, we're holding Mark Zero star chips, and we're going to start flying these things really soon. So it'll be pretty cool. Uh, so let me let me just quickly run through the the uh, you know the sort of rationale and some of the things that Yuri did. I, I may add a few, but again, there was a lot of questions I know last night. So we'd like to to give you more chance to uh, to chat. There's Phil. I just want, just the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, morning. <laughs> There's some Excedrin out there if anybody needs it. Uh, I guess the first thing is that, that largely due to Kepler and other work that's gone on in the last few years, uh, that uh, we now know that most stars have planets. Uh, you know, there's a, a bit of an uncertainty in the uh, Eta Earth, the number that have Earth-sized planets, but it appears to be roughly, you know, 25%, give or take 25%, uh, you know, but uh, uh, so this sort of tells us that, that there's planets everywhere that are the size of the Earth in what we know as a habitable zone. So the question that when, uh, about two years ago, I had Yuri come over to NASA Ames and we showed him the Kepler mission and, and so we, 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 that was when we were starting to figure out there were, you know, planets everywhere, and this was the question he asked. Uh, and uh, of course the first answer was, you gotta be kidding. Uh, you know, when you look at this problem, it is really, really hard, it still is really, really hard. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, as, as you saw last night, and I'll quickly review, the answer is, yeah, we could start to figure out how to do that, you know, and probably in the next few decades, so pretty exciting. Now. The, I really like these charts because ever since I was a kid, you know, I saw these solar system charts and I said, that's so boring. You know, I mean, it's same old planets, you know, now there's one less, now maybe there isn't. You know, I think we invited Alan Stern, but he didn't show up, so then. It's always fun to pick on Alan, who, as you know, was the New Horizons Pluto guy, and he gets really excited when you say, well, you know, I guess your planet got ejected. And it was, uh, but uh, uh, the really interesting thing here is that the nearest star is somewhat unusual, and this is Alpha and Beta Centauri. Uh, the, uh, I think the blue one is uh, Alpha. Those of you that are observational astronomers tell me if it's not, but it's one of those two. Uh, I'm supposed to be an observational astronomer, but I was a solar astronomer, and I didn't usually have much trouble finding it. Uh, <laughs> except after a few scotches. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that it's, uh, there's two solar type stars uh, and a third, as we heard yesterday, probable member. Uh, so, and it's really close in terms of kind of like astronomers. Uh, and as Yuri said, you know, the solution is to, is to do uh, light sailing uh, and uh, uh, the, this concept's been around since at least almost a century ago, uh, but 
lately there's been a lot of work on it, so it looks pretty feasible. Uh, and in, indeed, you know, you know, Kepler to Galileo, you know, uh, I think this was before they got locked up for heresy, uh, was uh, sort of prescient on what they're going to do. And again, as Yuri said, there's really three trends that make what you know a few decades ago looked impossible possible. Uh, you know, the the continuing uh, decrease in the size and increase in complexity of electronics. Uh, the uh, nanotechnology that, that, that uh, and when I say nanotechnology, the ability to build things, you know, molecule at a time. Uh, and that a lot of the work done in, in fiber optics, particularly to, for the internet, is now making it possible to begin to phase lasers together. So the, or, the, the result of this is the, is the star chip. Uh, and you know, the, a number of people in this room really pioneered that. I think Zach is around somewhere, and, and Mason Peck here too. You know, uh, the uh, uh, there's, you know, so this has been a a, a continuing uh, direction. Uh, you know, I got in a little trouble with NASA because when I got to Ames, I said, uh, you know, we ought to do small sats, and you know, NASA isn't about small anything. Uh, so there was a number of counseling sessions with various administrators uh, that like stop saying that you can do JPL's mission for a fraction of the cost, uh, even though we could. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, it, it actually, it's, it's really interesting because imitations is the, is the sincerest form of flattery because I now see JPL is doing all sorts of cool things and, on, on smaller and smaller satellites. So this is the next, uh, the next challenge. Uh, nanotechnology is obviously key to building this sail that has to put up with, you know, many gigawatts of power for a few minutes and hold together and, uh, and uh, not absorb much energy and reflect a significant quantity of it and transmit the rest. Uh, so, you know, 300 atoms thick, that's hard, but uh, it looks to be possible. Uh, and we're going to start doing experiments with this really soon. So putting those together, you end up with, a, with this, what we're calling a star chip. And, and I want to tell you that we are planning and, and we're going to welcome you know, the community. That's one reason that you're here and there'll be more conferences and meetings and so forth uh, about figuring out you know, what we do with this and where we send it and, and how we can begin to demonstrate it. Uh, of course, the other issue that Yuri talked about was the was the the laser beamer itself. Uh, by the way, we're a little sensitive about the word laser, you know, for obvious reasons. So it's a beamer. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's right, exactly. It's a, I, I won't tell the jokes about beamers, but last night you could have caught me and I would have told them. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we want to be able to get to the nearest star, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, in sort of, you know, a generation, kind of the time scale that people that, so it's kind of typical to NASA missions where you think of something and, you know, you actually get to see it usually in your lifetime. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Kepler, uh, I think it was in the 80s that Bill Baruchi, the PI on that, came up with a concept and I remember I first heard it and I said, that's rubbish, you can't get, you know, you know, you know these sort of micro-magnitude accuracies and he persisted and did. So we're going to do the same thing here. Uh, again, as, as uh, Yuri Milner said, uh, uh, there does seem to be a Moore's Law for lasers and there's no reason that that won't continue. Uh, so we can contemplate, you know, you know affordable uh, ability to phase, you know, many gigawatts and, you know, we're defining a number of steps to that. Uh, the other question, of course, and this is what we're really counting on, is that, you know, is there a Moore's Law for speed? Now, I'll say in the first half of the last century, which makes me feel really old, because I was actually born at the end of the first half of the last century, uh, you know, we were, we were on this, and then it kind of stood still for a while. Uh, and it's probably due to the fact we didn't try very hard, but uh, maybe we did. But uh, we think now with these new technologies, we're going to be back on that. And, you know, if you're on a Moore's Law, you can find within a few decades we're going to get into the tens of thousands of kilometers a second with macro things, again, starting with, with star chips. 
So the whole idea is, the, as we said, was the laser-powered nanocraft, and uh, you know we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, we've had a, I've been working on it really hard for the last year. Uh, in addition, you know, there's been other work that uh, that a lot of it funded by NASA. Uh, Phil Lubin, of course, uh, was funded by NASA as well as Zach Manchester and, and Mason Peck uh, to develop this stuff, and. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, I really want to commend my former agency for visionary, uh, you know, funding because without that we wouldn't have gotten there. Uh, but this, we really convinced ourselves that that this is something that is real and we can start working on it. Now, again, as Yuri said, there's sort of six phases, uh, uh, and, and I'm going to kind of briefly go through those. Each one of them have, you know, really formidable challenges, and we are going to open this to, uh, the, to, the, to the world. Uh, we hope here, just so that you know where we're going to go, in the next few weeks, uh, our core team is going to get together and define a notional roadmap, at least for the next few years. Uh, then we're going to take it to our advisory uh, panel uh, and then take it to our sponsors and uh, hopefully get started. But one of the key things is we'll, we'll announce an opportunity for funding. Uh, so, you know, there'll be a, 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 a really a global opportunity uh, to, to, to for teams around the world, uh, and, we, and I'll talk near the end of some things already started. Uh, of course, the, the nano craft is hard, but uh, is uh, uh, Pete Klupar, who is supposed to be here, where's Pete? Hiding? I think he's in the next room, uh, that uh, our engineering lead, uh, said, you know, we're not actually too far off from being able to build these things with the necessary capabilities, at least functionality. Uh, you know, the, the next thing, of course, is, is the light sail fabrication. Uh, and again, we will, you know, 300 atoms thick, we'll build these things layer by layer and hopefully begin to test those with high-powered lasers very, very soon. Uh, of course, the other, another really formidable thing is the laser beamer. Uh, this picture has nothing to do with what it'll probably look like, uh, but uh, we found it on the internet rather than having to... It's a square kilometer array. It's, it is. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it's a square kilometer array or whether it's the... Uh, yeah, uh, whether it's the solar power thing. You know, at any rate, it's, it kind of looks like the square kilometer array. Uh, it's an artist's impression of what might be That's right, yes. <laughs> By the way, we did look at an alternative, as I sort of alluded to last night, using microwaves, and we thought about, you know, the square kilometer array, and maybe we could work with them and put transmitters on it. Uh, you know, that's still something that is, is, is feasible, because uh, there are some interest in using that for uh, deep space. Uh, uh, it, it, we also point that there is at least, at least a, a kind of proof of, you know, ability to do this. Uh, uh, down in, in southeastern California, are these huge solar power uh, arrays. Now, they're not precision optics. They just reflect the sunlight, but uh, you know, these are working. They're producing, uh, I think, ultimately, when they're finished, a couple gigawatts of power. Uh, the, each one of those is two square kilometers, so you know, we're not too much out of the, out of the box there. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of looking at atmospheric absorption, and it seems to be the best window is around one micron. Uh, the uh, interesting thing is we want one micron up because we're going to use this array to receive and you know when you're going two tenths of light speed there's a bit of a redshift uh, so it, 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 it's you, you want a band there uh, the other thing of course is we looked at both space and ground-based systems uh, the uh, the original concepts that uh, Phil Lubin had, had postulated were a space-based system that is still an option but the, the, currently, the cost of building something that huge in space is is prohibitive, but it might not be in a few decades, so that's clearly a trade. Uh, but th there's also more formidable challenges politically with a privately funded giant laser in space. I think there were some bad movies about a certain Dr. Evil that... <laughs> the, uh, I guess that would be me. <laughs> uh, so... So this, is, so this is, again, a big challenge, and this is really where the political uh, part comes in. Uh, we, uh, the best place seems to be the Atacama Desert. Uh, there are areas there, like where the Alma Ray is, they're at five kilometers altitude, uh, driest places on Earth. Uh, 
you know, pretty good uh, uh, parameters. Uh, but there are, you know, certainly other places that we will look at. You know, the, uh, you know, some of them are lower altitude, like the Kalahari and the Australian outback. Uh, the place that's probably the best, given all the factors, is uh, this is Dome C in Antarctica, except there might be some construction problems. Uh, nonetheless, that, that is a, as a trade, so we're, you know, we're still looking at that. Because uh, uh, one of the big things is, is, is power. Uh, but you know, again, since you're only going to fire this thing a couple minutes a day, you don't need to have a 50 gigawatt power generation system. You need a kind of a standard you know, few hundred megawatts, that, but you need to store it. Uh, I point out that at least in the Atacama, there are some you know, uh, more infrastructure. Uh, Dome C would be more problematical. Uh, but in this case, we might be able to just buy the power uh, from, from the utilities there. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to sell it. But uh, they might also build some special system. It could be solar, it could be uh, 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 gas power, uh, or you know, and it was mentioned nuclear. Uh, but you know, we're not intending to build a nuclear power plant. But uh, if our if our host want to, that's fine. Energy storage is obviously another big issue. Uh, you know, today we're probably at least an order of magnitude off. You know, the ability to store. You know, this sort of one to two uh, gigawatt hours, but uh, we can certainly postulate where it is. This, by the way, we do our cost models, a big cost driver is the storage. And there are a number of technologies. Uh, of course, launch is, the, is the, the, the really exciting time. Anybody that worked for NASA or any other space agency knows that, you know, that's what we used to call a brown trouser job. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a, the, uh, I have a joke about that, but I won't tell it. <laughs> no, I didn't tell the whole thing. I did, I did to, to one of my all hands at Ames once, and uh, the, uh, that was one of the times that I had a counseling session with the administrator. <laughs> uh, at any rate, there's a couple things we're going to launch. Uh, the, obviously, the, the key thing is the mothership, which is uh, going to store perhaps a thousand or more of these uh, of these uh, star chips. Uh, the, uh, it's in a highly elliptical orbit. Uh, the uh, and critically inclined, uh, it's, it turns out that critically inclined orbits uh, are really perfect because, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, they're already kind of close to Alpha Centauri. You know, it's what, minus 64, I think. Uh, and these critically inclined, I think, are 61 degrees. So, uh, but anyhow, the mothership would deploy a star chip and then kind of scurry away. Uh, then we would uh, uh, fire the laser, and this is again a really exciting time, especially for the star chip. Uh, it's got to survive for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, again, as noted last night, there are technologies that, that seem to be uh, uh, already that, you know, we fire artillery rounds that, that are 100,000 Gs, and they have, they do guidance and even propulsion, so uh, interesting stuff. Uh, also mention, you know, there's stuff in space already. Uh, we, you know, I've been involved in the past in, in shining high power lasers into space for other reasons. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a function that the U.S. Space Command has, or U.S., yeah, U.S. Stratcom now, uh, that is uh, the laser clearinghouse, and it's fairly straightforward to get permission, but we would certainly, and I'm, this would undoubtedly be some international uh, effort. You, you probably would have parties that have a concern, would have a kill switch, so there, there's a number of things we can do. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little time to work that. Of course, crews, uh, you know, this is kind of what it looks like, I guess, if you're going point 0.2C. Uh, but uh, uh, after the acceleration, you know, we're going to send it to Alpha Sen. It does have propulsion on board, which is the, which is the lasers that would return the, the signal. Uh, you would probably fly it edge on uh, to minimize cross-section. Interstellar dust is a issue. Uh, you know, our preliminary calculations shows this is manageable. There's a handful of impacts. Uh, you can take some of them. The sail, of course, doesn't have any problem, but the, you know, you get a critical component. We might lose the star chip, but that's why we're going to send a lot of them. Uh, 
the uh, encounter. Uh, that's really the exciting thing. And, you know, and, and again, to show that we understand physics, we show that the planet would be elongated at 0.2 C. Uh, it, you have a few hours, uh, and the critical thing is we use the sail itself, reconfigure it as an optical element. We would probably distribute the lasers around it, so it would be a phased receiver as well as a transmitter. Uh, again, I, in my opinion, that's the hardest part, but that's just because, you know, I probably know more about that than other things. Uh, but, uh, and then the data delivery, uh, assuming we can, we get those images and can transmit them, the reception using the, re the transmit array in reverse, uh, you know, we've, we've showed the link margins and I think Phil Lubin last night talked about some of the, you know, the order of magnitude calculations, it does work. Uh, so it's a, uh, so it's a pretty big deal. Uh, as I said that, uh, you know, we are going to be as open as allowed by uh, regulation and law. So, I mean, we're not going to go publish everything, you know, if we have, if we work with partners that have critical either uh, 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 proprietary or there's export controls in whatever country we work in, that we will, we will uh, honor those, obviously, and, and abide by them. Uh, we have put our engineering challenges on the, on our website, the breakthroughinitiatives.org website. Uh, we are inviting comments and have already got quite a few, and we've got some really good suggestions that already seem to, to help. Uh, we're looking at roughly a 10-year R&D program. Uh, Yuri started the funding for this with 100 million. We certainly hope and, and we anticipate uh, additional funding from other high net worth people globally, and there's been some discussions already. Uh, as Yuri said last night, that for a number of years, and he was very specific on a number, we're going to do the basic research and then we're going to build a prototype. And we hope to have that done kind of, you know, in the 10, 15 year time frame. Our best estimate of a prototype is sort of, you know, a, a gigabuck uh, or giga euro or whatever you want to. Uh, we'll take checks in any currency. Uh, and we are going to start uh, a, uh, a program. I mean, I don't want to say specific grants because Breakthrough Prize Foundation is not a grant-giving organization, although we may change that. Uh, so that really demonstrates the proof of contact. Now, I'd like to close with a little discussion on this question, and this came up very early on is, you know, and this is why, you know, we've discussed Alpha Centauri. Is there anything there? You know, if the, if the, if the system just has a bunch of debris and, and small rocks, you know, it's, you know, you probably wouldn't spend many billions to take close-up pictures of rocks, although you might, depending on what you think is going to be in the rocks. Uh, but uh, we, we think there's a reasonable chance, and there was discussions yesterday, I'm sure there'll be more here today, that there are things there. Uh, we are convinced that we can start a couple different things uh, that, uh, that can, uh, you know, one of the key things is there are, uh, a set of, you know, six, eight meter class telescopes that we think can do this. We've been in discussion with the, the, the relevant observatories that, that uh, you know, we're going to try to all work together and, and sort of focus on, on, uh, on, uh, on 10 micron coronagraphs. Uh, I also want to point out that there's a couple near term uh, astrometry projects, not just for Alpha Centauri, but others. Uh, you've heard some of those discussions. I uh, particularly want to call out the Chinese STEP mission, uh, which we're very interested in seeing if we can't uh, uh, work that. Anthony Chen is here as the PI on that, I think, somewhere. Yeah, over. Yeah, so I mean, he, I'm sure he'll be happy to talk more about that. And, uh, uh, so we, but we also have some sort of small and intermediate s s class missions, so we're looking at those. Uh, I want to point out that there are a number of suborbital concepts. Uh, I think Web Cash is here and, and uh, Web somewhere over there, that has uh, is, is been a champion for some of these. Uh, these are very interesting and they could potentially demonstrate uh, a, uh, uh, the, the uh, external colder. Uh, so we're looking at some of those. Uh, of course, the, the next question is, what if there's nothing there? Uh, this is what I like to consider, you know, my solar system, uh, you know, out to out sort of, uh, you know, three, four parsecs or so. Uh, again, noting that most of the stars here are red dwarfs. Uh, you know, we, we certainly are very interested in that. Uh, we also have 
discussed how to, how to observe those. Uh, I want to emphasize that both the STEP mission and the, the sort of extremely large telescopes now under construction seem to be very capable of, of addressing uh, that issue. Uh, also, that the WFIRST mission that NASA plans uh, 2025 or so, uh, particularly associated with the starshade, has a lot of potential there. Uh, and then, of course, you know, ultimately there's a much deeper set of, uh, of, uh, of, of ideas. Uh, you know, NASA's beginning to look at things, the UV, uh, Louvoir, whatever it's called, and a few other concepts that are in the 2030s. I also want to point out that, that uh, Jeff Kuhn, who's here, has some concepts we're very interested in about 100 meter class instruments, and this is the Colossus, but there are other things as well. And then finally, I want to point out this array is a, you know, a kilometer class telescope. So fairly, fairly exciting future here. So we're, we're going to be working this for another probably few weeks or months, and we hope to announce a, a, a program ultimately of both near, mid, and longer term efforts that we would work with other funding agencies and individuals to, to move that forward. So one of the reasons that we're having this, con this discussion at Alpha Sen, and keep in mind it's not just Alpha Sen, is to see are there a number of targets? So I think to me, and I didn't take the strictly private and confidential off this, but it's not so private and confidential anymore, uh, is that, uh, that in the last few years, we've, we're convinced that, that you know, we can contemplate in this century uh, and you know, perhaps in a generation, uh, we can start expanding, expanding human reach to the stars, that is an incredibly cool thing. So let me stop there, and I'd be happy to answer more questions. Uh, if I can't answer them, there are experts here that can. If they can't answer it, you know, apply to money for us, and we'll see if we can work it. So thank you. Yep. Yeah, that's probably not what's going to happen. Uh, what you might do is have the payload, you know, that is deployed. You know, again, we have to work out the optics. Uh, that, uh, you know, that's one of the challenges. This is this notional design. I mean, we obviously wouldn't fire the, with the sensors and everything. You know, in the 50-gigawatt beam, that would be probably kind of uh, difficult. Can you think about what the tethers are made of anyway? No, we haven't. Yeah. I don't know, is, is the, I don't think we've gotten to what the optics would look like, but that's, that's why I think it's a big challenge, is, is how you do the optics. Uh, that, uh, and, you know, we, we've sort of talked about a, you know, shape, you know, uh, sort of a, uh, electrical applied uh, shape changing material to, to, to form an optic. That is a big challenge. The whole question is if you, if you're going to use sort of a prime focus or secondary, you got to deploy something. So that is a, that's that's clearly something we're going to have to work. So I, and I don't have. I mean, we haven't gotten to that. I mean, I want to clearly state there's a lot of questions like that that we are going to have to start working on, and it may be a it may be a showstopper. So and if it is, we'll have to look at other things. So no, you didn't. No, no, I, I, no, no. We, we've we have some notional ideas that how to do that. I, I don't, Pete. Do you have any comments on that or? No, but I, I, I guess his issue is really the, you know, when you're, when you're at Alpha Centauri, you've now shaped your sail into an optical element. Right. So, you so, so you have to deploy something right. that's, that's at either the prime focus or, or an optic, a secondary optic. You know, we don't know how to do that right. yet. And, and it... But my problem was with the acceleration phase. You don't yeah. Right. So it, it obviously would be protected in some way. Yeah, right. Exactly right.
Yes, yes, exactly. Actually, it yeah. may not be a separate uh, entity. It may be uh, part of the sale, but on the other side. But one comment that uh, should be made is that the, one of the biggest risks has to do with uh, uh, the sale not absorbing more than 10 minus 5 of the energy, because then it would look just like the wings of Icarus when it came close <laughs> to the sun. <center. laughs> uh, so since we're illuminating it with 50 gigawatts, uh, 10 to the minus 5 would just heat it up uh, uh, 30 times more than the sun, so to speak, but uh, it would not melt it. Uh, and getting down to an absorption coefficient of less than 10 to the minus 5 is a real challenge because uh, this sail is uh, Doppler shifting with time. Right? So even if you tune the material such that you get superb reflectivity at the wavelength of the laser, you have to make sure that it applies also to wavelengths that are 20% shifted relative to that. So this is a major challenge for material science, and we plan to look into that. Yeah. And, and, and it may turn out that you know some of these fiber lasers are tunable, so you may tune it as you, as you go. So I mean that, that there's you know this particular problem, like I said, is is to is to get this thing. That, you know we, we we're pretty sure we can build it at that that mass, but. To get it, so you've got an optic that survives and can be deployed or, and, and work as a, you know. And, and, and by the way, again, we we intend to start flying these things very soon, and start putting things on it and doing lab tests with with <coughs> laser. And we have, you know, suitably powerful lasers that we can do subscale tests here probably in the next year or two. But, but, uh, you know, in my opinion, the the optics and the survivability are more formidable than building the array to start with. I, I'll let Phil. Uh... Yeah, so in, you know, the stuff we've written is, is agnostic to that point, but the total um, delta T, the total change in momentum, is simply a function of the total energy that you apply during that period. Um, if you look at pulse lasers in general, um, their average uh, power delivery is much less than a CW laser of comparable systems. So I've, I've looked at this in great detail of all the lasers that exist currently. For example, if you want a kilowatt average power pulse laser, that's a very difficult thing to make. But a CW kilowatt laser is typically pretty easy. Um, the efficiency is, is higher. I wouldn't rule it out at all. It's just there doesn't appear to be any compelling reason. And there's another reason not to do pulse. We have to phase these things. And phasing nanosecond pulse lasers is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, yeah, Lou. Hope so. A really good point, which is the reason that we are anxious to get started on a on a comprehensive search of things that we can imagine going to. You know, maybe it's Tau Ceti that has the habitable planet. We already know it's got, I think, a couple planets by radio velocity. Uh, you know, it's. I mean, what is Tau Ceti about nine or ten light years? So, twelve. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's right at the edge of where we can imagine going. I mean, it's it becomes a a much longer trip. But you know maybe we have to start getting higher velocities. So 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 again, it's uh, we really hope that Alpha Sen is and the universe has been kind to us. And you know if you believe inside of fate, you know the fact that the nearest star is this kind of double solar type star is kind of interesting. No, no. Well, I don't. We, we don't know. Maybe there's life in the upper atmosphere. You know, I I, I saw those movies about cloud cities and everything. It's pretty cool. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a real honor. It seems to me that uh, if you launch like several thousand of these uh, space yeah. spaceships, uh, that you can get like established like a pipeline, especially if they come in yes. to each other. We, yeah, we've looked at that. That is a, a trade. The trouble is that, you know, if you lose a couple of them, it's sort of, you know, I, I remember when I was a kid, we had these holiday lights, and they were, uh, they were in series. And every year my mother would bring them out, and none of them worked. And it, yeah, yeah, so I mean, it begins to be a hard, you know, I remember the excitement, you know, we first changed out each bulb individually, about half the time that worked, but most of the time you had to change them all out, so, so yeah, so, yeah, that's, so anyhow, that's, a, yeah. Speaking about your experience with JPL, and before going to Alpha Centauri, why don't we explore the solar system as a precursor? Oh, we very much intend to, and it, it, you know, and, and I think that this, this is, you know, there was a little discussion last night. We are not trying to do space agencies' missions for them. So, but we, we hope to work closely with space agencies as we develop this technology. I think there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, the, the, the first people we talked to on this was, was the JPL director. And, uh, uh, and then I went to talk to the NASA leadership and the White House and, uh, uh, the Congress, and then I went to, uh, we talked to the European Space Agency. Uh, we've talked to other space agencies about parts of this. So, you know, we're very, you know, this, this is a collaborative thing, you know, and, and again, I mean, I might have said a little facetiously when I was NASA Ames, you know, uh, we were trying to push cheaper stuff, but we're really anxious to not get, you know, where we, we're seen as some sort of, okay, these guys are going to, uh, you know, make it hard to go do missions. Uh, it, it is, really interesting to us that when you do like the Europa mission, that uh, if these things are mature enough that you carry a bunch of star chips and you can use them for impactors and other kinds of things. So it's a very exciting set of, of, of uh, you know, of, of possibilities. So, yeah, yeah, Graham. Um, I had a question, actually queuing into what you just said. All the organizations mm -hmm. you've, you've just spoken to. And, uh, There'll be more. We're going to talk to everybody globally. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm, sort of, I'm wondering how, what your engagement mechanism for doing that, and I'm, and I'm asking this sort of in a broader sense, just before you started talking to Jamie, uh, said to me something that was kind of interesting, I asked him about breakthrough listening, and he said, well, these are interlocked, right, because yep. this mission is, is part of, you know, it, it is arguably a, a message as well, and, and essentially, so, and, and I would argue that in the context of SETI, listening is just as compelling a way to explore. So if those are interlocked, um, and, and you know I'm not wearing my IBM hat yeah. when I'm asking you this, how are you going to engage with, yep. what, what, what's the business framework, if you want to put it that way, to engage other partners and, and get this sort of become a, a global thing? Well, and it, it, let, let me say that, you know, we're going to announce very soon the Breakthrough Message Contest, which is a global engagement uh, and it's an engagement at a couple levels. It's an engagement, first of all, with the creative community. So we'll have pieces that, that uh, you know, people are involved in creative arts and other things. Can, the other one will be a public engagement uh, where we'll probably do, uh, you know, some contest. Uh, you know, so that's one thing. I, I guess the, the thing I, I have to, con you know, confess is, you know, the, 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 the Breakthrough Prize Foundation staff right now is three people, all of whom are in this room. Uh, so, you know, you know, we'll get to it, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're working with other groups. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the groups that we're, that we're teamed with is working closely with the, uh, uh, uh the Hundred Year Starship Foundation. You know, the Breakthrough Listen Project is led out of Berkeley, and we've been in a lot of discussions how to do that. We're already working at one level with, uh, we've released some data, but we're also releasing data to the uh, SETI at home. Uh, you know, we're looking forward to working with the SETI Institute on some of the things they're doing, and uh, you know, it's a this is a massive undertaking. Uh, you know that that we're going to have to team with people because, you know, you know, I've already had my fun running an organization of 2,500 people, so I don't want to do that again. Uh, 
you know, that, that there's at least 2,500 personnel challenges. So. Not the least is my own. Yeah, we don't get any sleep. Uh, well, let me stop there. Let me stop there, and I, you know, because I know I don't want to eat into the time to discuss the, the other critical stuff. But I, I want to thank all of you. Uh, this is really cool, and uh, you know, this is the first of many breakthrough discuss efforts, and we need your help on all the things: breakthrough, listen, breakthrough, uh, Starshot, uh, the, uh, the you know, detecting what's there, uh, and breakthrough message. So, as NASA used to say, Godspeed. So. And, and, and.